don't know if I'm live yet. Up. Oh. Start please streaming. Go. <laughs> and I think we are live. Hey guys, what's going on? Mike the Caveman Cune here again. Paleo right. Problem Long Island. So, Mikethecaveman.com. Got another if edition so, of Monday hey, Nights with Mike do live do stream Q and A live on YouTube. And yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and see uh, what's going on. Start streaming. We are live right now. I'm going to pop over for a second onto Facebook to make sure that I can share this link. Another edition. That way I can get anybody that's in there needs to be on. Let's see. And yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look and All right. see. Uh, you on watch on page. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share this to right Facebook. Now. I'm going to pop and over. So yeah, you guys can see, see what's, what's going on. on to hey guys, going on? My K -Man Q here. Facebook to make and sure. And looks like we got some people in right now. Link. Who we got? That way we can get anybody that's who joined the team. On. That's YouTube. All right. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look. Hold on. All right. I'm on watch page. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share this to right Facebook. Now. I'm going to pop and over. So yeah, you guys can see, see right what's going on. on to hey guys, go All right. So, and listen, sure we got some people. Sure. As you know, we got a whole bunch of new yeah. stuff in there. Let me know in the chat box if you're here. Um, say what's up. And also let me know how much of a lag we have going on. It looks like we are a little bit laggy. Apparently, we have a little bit of issues regarding that nonsense again. So, I'm going to share this over right. to Facebook real quick. So, as you know, we've got a whole bunch of new stuff in there. Let me know in the chat box if you're here. Um, say what's up. And also let me know how much of a lag we have going on. It looks like we are a little bit laggy. Apparently, we have a little bit of issues regarding... Bam. All right. So, yeah, you know the deal, guys. Put your questions down below. Uh, what we'll do is we will start... Hey, Shoshana, what's up? So, let's get some good questions going, man. Uh, am I lagging right now? If you can let me know, that would be great. What I will do in the interim, I believe I am. I'm going to shrink me down. I'm going to switch to my okay. other cut. All right. <sighs> so, yeah, you know the deal, second guys. Put your questions down below. No, not it's that before. one. Uh, what we'll Chrome do is we will start. Settings. Hey, Shoshana, what's up? So, let's get some good questions going then. Uh, how, am I lagging right now? If you could let me know, that would be great. What I will do in the settings on Chrome. I, I am. I'm going to shrink me down. Awesome. I'm going to switch to my other All right. Cut. All right. <sighs> so, yeah, you know the second scene. Now, now, let's see. Uh, we'll do now that we have the live start. chat hey, over there, what's up? where's the chat? Up? So, if you notice, I have something new that I'm playing around with. I have the chat going. She was supposed to be able to see it on the side there. It doesn't appear to be playing for one reason or another. Oh, wait, you know what? I know why it's not playing. Ah, so you know what? Hold on one second, guys. Where's the chat? So, you notice I have something new that I'm playing with. Hold on. Pop out the chat. Forgot about that. She was supposed to be able to see it on the side there. Copy. It doesn't appear to be playing for... That's why my live chat's not playing. Oh, wait, you know what? I know why it's not playing. Let's see. And ah, bam. So you know what? Hold on. Cool. One so second. we have our live chat now available. So I've been playing around with the new, all the new tools, getting used to how this bad boy works. You need to know a good source of protein that's in liquid form besides protein shakes and yogurt. Great, great question, Shoshana. So what are some liquid sources of protein? Now, when we're talking about uh, food in general, the biggest problem with liquid sources of calories is the fact that it's easier to overeat. However, in certain instances, whether you had to have surgery or something went on where you know, your mouth protein shut, then yeah, you're going to need... Uh, so, you're gonna be talking what twice, are some really. Liquid sources of protein. Now, when we're talking about uh, food in general, the biggest problem with liquid sources of calories. So you hear me talking twice? Easier to so I've been playing around with right? all the new However, mm -hmm. in certain instances, let me know if that's still going on. To have surgery, um, something went on where you know, besides protein that's shot, weird. Yogurt, so yeah, let me know how the audio is coming out. I'll have to see what's going on. So yeah. Regarding the liquid again, some cases though you actually are just going to need to have liquid calories. So, in terms of some of the best sources otherwise, things like kefir, 
Um, so besides Jokic. So kefir is going to be a good bet. Other than that, though, so yeah, it'll be in terms of liquid protein, unfortunately, with the exception of dairy sources, so like lasa, the liquid again. Some cases though, you actually are just going to need. What's the Icelandic one? Cold liquid gas. So hold on, let's find out. In terms of some of the best sources, otherwise, things like kefir. I think it's called skewer. So kefir is going to be a good bet. Other than that, though, so yeah, it'll be in terms of liquid protein, unfortunately. Oh, with the exception so, of dairy sources. Yeah. So like yeah. Uh, you talk and I hear you repeat it again like 40 times. So what is playing? Something must be... Maybe it's the preview? Something in the background then is playing that is catching you right now. Something's catching my audio. What do I have open that's playing my audio? Yeah. You talk and I hear you repeat it again like 40 times. So what is playing? Something Something must be it's not that. It's not that. Maybe it's the preview. It's Something so weird. In the background. So I'm gonna open this. Is playing that. So kefir is gonna be a Is catching. <laughs> Something catching it, my audio. Is it gay to drink gluten-free <laughs> beer? It's playing my audio. So hold on. Uh, no, I would say no. So <laughs> I'll come back to that in a second. Let me. Let me come back to that question in a second. Not that, it's not that. Maybe it's the preview. It's so weird. <laughs> so I'm going to open this. Oh, man. They got somebody asking what time I'm on, so. Is it gay to drink gluten-free beer? And we are live now. All right. So, no. I would I will try to figure out what's going on with that audio in a second. Let me. Finishing up yours right there. The Icelandic style of yogurt. Sigis makes it, and they call it. Uh, skier. Oh, man. Right, probably pronouncing that terrible. S K Y R. Okay, so that's another option too. It's similar to a yogurt. You know, it's another option. There really, honestly, aren't too many great options of what you can have in terms of. Wait, that makes no sense. I shouldn't. My audio is completely off. So, like, I'm on mute. Right. Probably pronouncing that terrible. S K Y R. Okay, so that's another option too. It's similar to a yogurt. You know, it's another option. There really, honestly, aren't too many great options. Uh, son of a big what you can uh, have in terms of the Icelandic big. that makes no sense I shouldn't my audio is completely off call it was open sorry guys sorry about that audio Ooh. wow okay that's annoying as shit sorry Maybe that's it right there. Protein in here. So. <laughs> Let's see. So maybe now. Let's see. Can you even hear me now? Let's find out. So my microphone should be on. Desktop audio. I think that's the problem. The desktop audio is playing. So let me know if you even hear me now. Can you hear me now? Good. Protein if you hit. So. <laughs> okay, Let's yeah. So All right, so I think I think I fixed that. Yeah. Not so. Not even hear me now. Perfect. All right, excuse me. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm glad I was able to figure that out. Um. I guess my desktop was playing, even though I was on mute, so it made no sense, but cool. So we're back. Um, so I'm really sorry about the audio. I'm, I'm getting used to I'm trying to get this fancier, and now, now we have this. Awesome. Okay. So got me the Imarina protein-infused water. I'll have to look that up. But to answer your gluten-free beer gay, no, it is not gay. I mean, what does that even mean realistically? But... Now, if you absolutely had to have beer and you know that you have issues with gluten, then no, probably is better off to have that than pretty much anything else. If you don't have issues with gluten, then, you know, knock yourself out if you really enjoy beer. If beer's not your thing, you can always go with other liquors and stuff. So that's always a good bet as well. Um, 
Can't want to figure out how the hell you pronounce skier. So let's see. Pronunciation. All right. Let's see. <laughs> skier. Interesting. Eh, whatever. Okay. So going back to this bad boy over here. Boom. Let's go. So you said it's called. Hey, Murray, what's up? So it's called Tremino. Tremino. Protein water. So, Murray, you joined a little bit later. You are so lucky you missed all of the nonsense that we had earlier with uh, the audio. That was some terrible nonsense in the beginning. I truly, truly apologize for that. I don't know what the hell was happening with that nonsense. Currently, well, it's kind of uh, clear that. Okay. Apply. Okay. Tremino water. Let's see what we have inside this bad boy. Drink Tremino. Hey, what's up, buddy? Seven grams of protein isolate infused in water. 28 calories, which would be, in fact, seven grams of protein. That makes sense. Let's see. We get seven grams of protein, B complex vitamins. Yeah. And for those of you listening, Murray was nice enough to help me out last week. Uh, at some point, we were trying to figure out what was happening with uh, last week's buffering. And it still appears to have a little bit of lag. It's not the best right now, but we're doing a little better. Uh, now we have the audio problems. So, like, I can't win. <laughs> I just can't win. Um, yeah. So, we have here. Protein never tastes so good. Building blocks. Where's the ingredients? Uh, products. View label. Five will grab peach. It's the first one here. So Tremino water. Purified water, whey protein isolate, phosphoric acid, natural peach, oh, malic acid, natural peach flavor, Acylvine potassium, of course, pantothenic acid, vitamin B5, niacinamide, B3, sucralose, of course, uh, peroxidine uh, hydrochloride, and cyanocobalamin. All right, so my biggest problems looking at this right now, and for whatever reason can't zoom this bad boy down. Ah, there we go. My biggest problems, let's just see if we can zoom that in. Awesome, perfect. Let's see. Yes. So my biggest problems right now are, again, the acylphane potassium and the sucralose. So acylphane potassium and sucralose, two of those are going to be causing problems regarding your gut bacteria and could potentially even cause issues with uh, your blood sugar regulation. So even though you know, uh, sugar alcohols or artificial sweeteners aren't supposed to cause uh, variations in your blood sugar, they actually can. Like here, you know, we've been playing this game with uh, looking up different types of um, different types of studies. Since we have that there, let's let's pull it up. Artificial sweeteners, microbiome. So. <laughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Yeah, natural flavors is a interesting one in terms of what we have going on. So, natural flavors can be anything from the actual food that we're talking about, all the way up to you know beaver anus, you know castorium. Now, that's not really the biggest problem, but. You know, it, there can be some squirrely stuff, you know. Arsenic is natural, so probably don't want to have that be your primary source of flavoring. Pretty sure it's probably illegal too, but... Anyway, non-caloric artificial sweeteners and the microbiome. Findings and challenges. And this is a study from 2015. So we have the pub buels. Switch over to the PDF. It's a little prettier. 
All right. So non-caloric artificial sweeteners are common food supplements consumed by millions worldwide as a means of combating weight gain and diabetes by retaining the sweet taste without increasing caloric intake. While they are considered safe, there is an increase in controversy regarding their potential derangement or potential ability to promote metabolic derangements in some humans. We recently demonstrated that NAS or non-caloric artificial sweeteners consumption could induce glucose intolerance in mice and distinct human subjects by functionally altering the microbiome. In this commentary, we discuss these findings in the context of previous and recent works demonstrating the effects of host and the host health and the microbiome. The challenge is open questions that need to be addressed and understand the effects of NAS consumption on health. So, going through here, in search of causality of uh, non uh, non caloric artificial sweeteners, their effects, animal modeling. So, what I'll do is I'll actually pull up real quick. A sulfate and potassium, let's say. So, bam. Some of the examples of non favorable, non artificial sweeteners, metabolic effects suggest that in such models include works by switchers and colleagues, demonstrated weight gain in rats following consumption of saccharin, A sulfate and potassium, or stevia, with saccharin also linked to adip uh, increased adiposity. Uh, adiposity. Interesting, because first of all, A, Stevia is not an artificial sweetener, um, depending on what we have. We have like a Truvia or something, and maybe it might be. But generally speaking, Stevia is not an artificial sweetener. But building off of that, I'd be interested in looking at that study. So maybe we can pull that one up in a second. But increased weight gain, though, uh, as a result of artificial sweeteners. Okay, be careful with that. Yes, absolutely correct, Murray, regarding the uh, type of the type of um, vitamin B12 in there, cyanocobalamin, not necessarily the best thing. You're really going to want to look at methylcobalamin in terms of the way that you're going on. If you have the MTHFR, you know, the motherfucker, I mean, whoops, <laughs> gene variations, it can possibly be a problem. Um, hey, Mike, big fan. Also curious about glucose. What are your thoughts on EMA? I'll come back to that in a second. Let me just finish up this thought over here. And EMA in terms of what now? Uh, so finish up with this right here, though. So the non artificial sweeteners, though, besides being able to just induce weight gain, it's also uh, acylphane potassium. Let's see, sucralose. That was the other one that's in there. Sucralose. Rats consuming sucralose were shown by Schiffman and colleagues to gain more weight, a uh, finding that initiate intense debate. Uh, okay, another one for sucralose. Uh, we have non-caloric sweeteners uh, effects on some commensal gut microbes and suggested that sucralose consumption was associated with underrepresentation of several commensals of the rat microbiome. Essentially what that means, commensal bacteria are generally the, yeah, not necessarily always the best, the good ones. Eating my ass. Nah, big fan, huh? Those like eating your ass? Nah, we'll see. <laughs> so in terms of that right there in terms of underrepresentation, the commensal bacteria is essentially like i said they are the ones not necessarily always the good uh, bacteria but they aren't necessarily the bad they're not the pathogenic style bacteria so that being said those can end up resulting in a decrease of the beneficial bacteria all right what's some other ones we have going on there then other ones for sucralose, which again was in that Tremino water, we have compared to glucose control, enhanced glucose intolerance in mice drinking either saccharin, sucrose, or aspartame was noted as early as eight weeks following initiation of non-caloric artificial sweetener consumption. So this phenotype uh, seemed to be microbiome related as two different antibiotic regimens targeting gram-positive ne uh, gram or gram-negative bacteria abrogated the NAS-induced glucose intolerance. So essentially, that the antibiotics, which when, which went and took out those bacteria, were able to turn down the effects of the glucose intolerance. All right. So let's see. Moving past that, further studies need to decipher the mechanisms driving the metabolic consequences of sucralose uh, in mice, and whether they are similar or distinct from those for saccharin. Right, that's not really as important. Uh, remains to be determined whether sucralose also directly affects the microbiome 
as for aspartame, which is not in the Tremino, but for now, its utilization by bacteria has been reported, even though aspartame is metabolized by the host. Um, it is possible that the products of aspartame degradation affect the microbiome or alternatively that indirect mechanisms are involved. So essentially, we're talking about aspartame, which again is not in that one, but that's another one of the artificial sweeteners that can negatively affect your microbiome. So yeah, essentially, that's what we're looking at there. Um, I kind of want to look at the other study though, the Swindir. So general and persistent effects of sweeteners on the body and caloric in rats. Because that was talking about stevia. That was the important one, part of that study. All right, going back to uh, Hufflepuff for a second <laughs> for his uh, or her. What's the cheapest way to gain 10 pounds? Probably a McDonald's diet if you really want to gain 10 pounds quick. If we're talking about 10 pounds of muscle and you want to do it cheap and quick, there's always the GoMad method, you know, drinking the gallon of milk a day, you know, GoMad, G-O-M-A-D, gallon of milk a day. Uh, don't know that I'd really recommend that, but if you really want to gain weight super quick, particularly muscular weight, and you tolerate dairy well, go to town. <laughs> That's probably your best bet. Okay. Uh, in early work, Swither and Davidson rats provided with fixed amount of yogurt diet mixed with saccharin uh, gained more weight and showed impaired caloric compensation relative rats given the same amount of uh, yogurt mixed with glucose. The uh, president for experiments examined the generality of these findings and demonstrated that increased body weight gain was demonstrated when animals consumed a yogurt diet sweetened with alternative high intensity sweetener, such as acylphane potassium or ACE-K, as well as in animals given saccharin sweetened based diet, which is refried beans, that was calorically similar but nutritionally distinct from low fat yogurt. These studies also extended earlier findings to show that body weight differences persist after saccharin sweetened diets are discontinued and following a shift in the diet to one sweetened with glucose. So, so again, what we're talking about here is essentially that after we shift away from the... Uh, after we shift away from, ugh, sorry, brain fart. After we switched away from the saccharin sweetened or the acylphine potassium sweetened ones, there was a change long term. So that's generally indicating that something went wrong. What are we talking about? Well, the microbiome was shifted from the consumption of those non caloric sweeteners. So they did have an effect on your bacteria. So where it's talking about stevia, though, that's where it gets interesting. Because it mentions stevia in this one. Oh, you know what? Wrong study. Sorry about that. It was 11 swithers here. High intensity sweeteners and energy balance. Is the one with stevia. Swithers. I spelled the guy's name wrong. Oh, no, I actually got it right. Swithers 2010. <laughs> All right. Recent, epidemiolo recent epidemiological evidence points to a link between a variety of health negative health consequences, you know, such as, e.g., metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and the consumption of both calorically sweetened beverages and beverages sweetened with high-intensity non-caloric sweeteners. Research on the possibility that non-nutritive sweeteners promote food intake, body weight gain, and metabolic disorders has been hindered by a lack of physiologically relevant model that describes the mechanistic basis for these outcomes. We have suggested that based on Pavlovian conditioning principles, consumption of non-nutritive sweeteners could result in sweet tastes no longer serving as consistent predictors of nutritive post-ingestive uh, consequences. This, dissoci this dissociation between a sweet taste serving as consistent predictors of this dissociation between the sweet taste cues and the caloric consequences could lead to a decrease in the ability of sweet taste to evoke physiological responses that serve to regulate energy balance. Using the rodent model, we have found that food intakes of fluids containing non nutritive sweeteners was accompanied by increased food intake, body weight gain, accumulation of body fat, and weaker caloric compensation compared to consumption of foods 
and fluids containing glucose. Our research also provided evidence consistent with the hypothesis that these effects to consuming saccharin may be associated with decrement in the ability of sweet taste to evoke themic responses and perhaps other physiologic cephalic reflexes that are thought to help maintain energy balance. Probably lost everybody at this point of the video as I'm ranting on this uh, story here. So, yeah. With that being said, we are talking about um, stevia at this point. And let's see what we got going on here. We have Swithers. They had mentioned stevia. Stevia solutions have effects on body weight gain similar to saccharin. Very, very interesting. So to assess the generality of the effects, body weight gain was significantly higher. Weight gain for rats given stevia and those given saccharin did not defer significantly at any point during the training. In contrast, by the end of 15 days, exposure of the weight gain for each of these groups. <laughs> yes, you're falling asleep on me. <laughs> so interesting. So looking at this graph right here, we have stevia, saccharin, and glucose. Essentially, we are looking at a gain in weight pretty much on all of them. Sugar, we have our glucose, starts slightly higher than the other two and actually has a lower base point. When you went to switch over to saccharin, which is uh, sweet and low, that end up with the worst overall results over time. And then stevia, though, apparently seems to indicate on this particular study in in rats or rather yeah, in rats that it can also have the same problem all right so Murray, you're falling asleep on me how about you give me another question then <laughs> all right so give me another question so we can get off this topic then what i will do otherwise though going back to this here <laughs> Well, apparently we had some trolls there for talking twice. Da, 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 uh -huh. <laughs> so what questions we got? So we guys, we just ranted on a whole long topic about the microbiome and how non-caloric sweeteners can be problematic and can actually cause problems there. And what I'll do is actually link to the original study that we started with here. That's the first one we were talking about. I will add that there. Aside from iodine, what are some other natural uh, thyroid support? Awesome question. And the first thing, more important than iodine, more often than not, I would say is even selenium. Selenium is very underrated in terms of its importance. Okay. So I'm going to add this real quick. Uh, selenium is completely underrated. I'm just going to copy this because it's part of your body's ability to detoxify and it helps to support proper thyroid function. So, save that. Boom. That should now be in the area underneath. But here, selenium and proper thyroid function. Let's, let's pull that one up. All right. All right. Selenium and the thyroid. Selenium iodine and oil me thyroiditis. Selenium and the thyroid gland, more good news for clinicians. So let's open those two bad boys up. So we take a look real quick. Boom. Purpose of this review is to look at an update of the role of the essential trace mineral that element, selenium, and its interaction with the other trace elements, iodine and iron. Essentially, though, most cases, uh, low uh, most of the still low numbers of cases indicate that the selenium administration in both autoimmune thyroiditis and mild graves improves clinical stores, improves clinical scores and well-being of patients and reduces thyroid peroxidase antibody titers. And however, published results are still conflicting depending on basal selenium dose status, oh wait, basal selenium status, dose, time, and form of selenium used for prevention. Evidence for sex-specific selenium action, lack of beneficial special effects in pregnancy, and contribution of genetic polymorphisms has been presented. So there are going to be other issues at hand, but that is definitely a good idea to look into. You're going to want to consider looking at 
selenium uh, supplementation. Is this one available? Let's see real quick. No, I'd have to request that one. So this particular study, no good. Let's see this one though. Selenium in the treatment of thyroid disease, an element in search of relevant indications. Dun, 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 dun. Selenium deficiency has been associated with a number of diseases, including thyroid disease, such as goiter, hypothyroidism, and autoimmune thyroiditis. It's an essential micronutrient that is incorporated into biologically active selenium proteins as the amino acid selenocysteine. So among these are the most important ones. And in healthy thyroid individuals with marginal uh, selenium deficiency, selenium substitution has only minute and clinical, clinically insignificant effects on uh, thyroid function. Interesting. I've seen practically uh, there. I've seen benefit there. Does it matter if, uh, whether you have under or over active thyroid when supplementing with selenium? It's a great question. So if we look here, goiter is generally on the up end, hypothyroidism and autoimmune are generally on the down end. So generally no. So uh, in euthyroid individuals, so people who have neither, we have hypothyroidism with or without thyroid, pro uh, bleh, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, Graves. So hyper. Graves, of course, is a hyperthyroidism. So 50% uh, of responders would continue with selenium after readmission of her Graves based on a single study, which showed significantly improved quality of life, reduced eye involvement, and improved clinical activity score in the selenium group. The Europe European Thyroid Association suggests a six-month trial of selenium in patients with mild Graves. So Graves, uh, well, they're specifically responding to uh, ophthalmoth... <laughs> Generally, I'm pretty good at these words. Ophthalmoth... Ophthalmopathy. <laughs> Fuck it, I'm I'm done. Ophthalmopathy. That's why I'm not an ophthalmologist, because I can't say that word. Oh boy. <laughs> From the day provided by Negro et al. That's yeah. <laughs> that's just yeah. Anyway, apparently that's somebody's name. Cool. <laughs> so essentially, <clears throat> does Slindum get tested on a routine blood test? Generally, no. So most of the time. You're not getting your selenium tested. It would not be a terrible idea, though, to request that, particularly if you think you're dealing with thyroid issues. So generally speaking, your best bet is just get a little extra selenium. And anybody that I think either needs some more antioxidant support or is dealing with thyroid issues, I'll generally have them start to do a little bit of selenium anyway. Your easiest way of doing that is, or is our Brazil nuts. Brazil nuts are probably the best source of selenium. I think like three or four Brazil nuts is basically a day's worth there. So yeah. So a, a daily Brazil nut better than a supplement for selenium. World's healthiest foods. So let's see. Dietary supplement. Yeah, Chris Gunnison. Selenium, the missing link for treating hypothyroidism. <laughs> but yeah, it only takes one or two per day to improve your selenium status and boost immune function. Interesting. We'll come back to we'll come back to that in a second. But going back to the world's healthiest foods. New Zealand researchers compared Brazil nuts' efficacy to that of selenothionine supplements and increasing selenium status. It's probably the one that Cresser quoted too. In 59 New Zealand residents with low pla uh, selenium, plasma selenium concentrations of less than 1.27 micromole per liter, they were assigned randomly to uh, three different groups. Da -da -da. One group ate two Brazil nuts each day. So two Brazil nuts each day. A second group took a supplement providing 100 micrograms of selenium, a selenomethionine per day. And the third group received a placebo pill. Both levels, blood levels of selenium and uh, glutathione peroxidase, a selenium-containing enzyme that is one of the body's most important antioxidants. Activities were measured at the beginning of the study and that at 2, 4, and 8 weeks, sorry, 2, 4, 8, and 12 weeks, and we saw increases. I'm not going to read the numbers. You, you can read that right there if you'd like. So again, selenomethionine is the one of the more common ones. Honestly, I would just go and eat some Brazil nuts. But here. One Brazil nut a day would be sufficient to raise dietary selenium intake to within recommended levels. 
So one a day. How insane is that? So, oh, hello. No, that's not what I want. Look here. Selenium. Best source of selenium. Fish are some other ones. Uh, fish are excellent sources of selenium. Hey, what kind of nonsense is that? Selenium. This one always has like, this one has like pretty graphs and charts and stuff. Here we go. Tuna, excellent source. You get 223 there. Now, the thing about eating fish though for selenium, to be clear, is that fish may also fit, especially those that are higher on the food chain, may contain more mercury. Now, that does go and make mercury less of a concern because the selenium actually chelates, locks up the mercury, so it's not necessarily as bioavailable. That being said, you're still going to get some. So as you see, tuna, shrimp, sardines, salmon, turkey, cod, chicken, lamb, scallops, and beef. All great sources of selenium, Brazil nuts. Here, <laughs> you read about Brazil nuts as a strong source of the mineral. Depending on where they are grown, this will be true. One ounce of Brazil nuts may contain as much as 10 times the dietary reference intake. Other exceptional selenium sources include oysters, clams, liver, and kidney. So each of these is likely to contain double or triple the DRI in a serving. These foods are the exception, however, and not the rule. So those are just generally your best bet. A couple of Brazil nuts and you'll be ready to rock. Cow's milk, flaxseed, shiitake mushrooms, asparagus. <laughs> so those are all some good options in terms of, well, not all. I wouldn't recommend barley for it and whatever. You get the point. Fish, Brazil nuts, mushrooms, and you're ready to go. All right. And let's see if uh, Cresser was using the same. Let's see if he had the same study he was talking about. Brazil nuts. Takes only one or two a day to boost selenium stats and immune function. So this is an American uh, so Journal of Clinical Nutrition study from 2008. Brazil nuts are an effective way to improve selenium status. Brazil nuts provide a rich source of selenium, yet no studies have investigated the bioavailability of selenium in humans. We investigated the efficacy of Brazil nuts increasing selenium status. So yes, this is in fact the actual study that was referenced on the World's Healthiest Food site before. So let's cut out the HTML. Bam. So I will go and take this bad boy and I will slap that over into the chat box as well. Da, 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 da. Or rather into the description box, not the chat box. Not the word I was looking for. Hmm, where is the citation? Meh. Nah. So what, what articles have cited this? View ones that have cited. Articles citing this, let's see if there's newer ones. Or rather, even better. Let's take that. Brazil nuts, an effective way to improve selenium status. Bam. So we have it right there. Uh, what has cited this real quick? Influence of genetic variation in selenium proteins on gene pattern expression after supplementation with Brazil nuts. Interesting. So we're, in that one uh, study, they were mentioning how it could potentially change based on how uh, an individual's genes and whatnot. So there apparently actually are different polymorphisms for that. Central micronutrient hypothesized the presence of genetic polymorphisms in selenium proteins may influence the gene expression of specific selenium proteins, influence the pattern of global expression after that supplementation, and uh, this study was conducted with 130 da, da. genetic variations in selenium protein genes modulated those different gene expressions and re in response to nut supplementation. So let's see. Nutritional intervention, washout. That's just explaining the protocol. Go back. Whoa, not what we wanted there. So, looking at this, Lino proteins in Brazil uh, afterwards. So, GG refers to what? What is GG? What the hell is CC? Oh, uh, it's probably the base pairs. MRI. Yeah, okay. So it's the mRNA base pair expression. 
So before and after, yeah, that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about right now. That's getting a little deep down the rabbit hole right now. So screw that. Yeah, we'll come back to the other Brazil nuts. All right, so what other questions do we have going on right now? Right now. I think we I think we lost some people on the uh <laughs> the first one. We were talking about the various uh we were talking about the various gut bacteria and artificial sweetener links. I think that sent some people away. <laughs> sent them packing. That and my uh troll coming on before. So <laughs> oh man. So Murray, what other questions you got going on? Because right now you are my, you you're my sunshine right now. You you're my go-to right now. While we're waiting for you to finish it up, there I'm gonna go and add that link to the study regarding Brazil nuts. Now I had some other questions to cover before. <laughs> I'll go get, go get the Brazil nuts. Absolutely, I love Brazil nuts too. They're delicious. If you actually have to crack them, that's where it gets a little squirrely. Like, those things are ginormous. But other than that, I am a big fan of Brazil nuts. So if you're, if you're trying to get in some extra selenium, super easy way of getting it done. Bam. So what else you got for me? See. I feel like I had some other questions lined up. I usually do. I've been slacking right now. Oh, no. Stay. Don't leave me yet. All right, so just added that bad boy to the description of the live stream. Hmm. Save changes. Bam. How? Yeah, bam. So you should be able to see that down below. What does it look like right now? How? After technical difficulties in the morning, primary stream. YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain a smooth streaming as view, such viewers will be experiencing bad buffering. Ugh. Oh, so, you know, I did have come across an interesting study earlier that the other day that I'd like to talk about a little bit. Let's see. Video signal is currently terrible by the border, but good to know for the future. <laughs> all right, so all right, so let's, let's pull this one up. I was reading this one the other day because uh, right now, so I'm working on my doctorate. For those of you who don't know, but I feel like at this point, most of you probably should. If you don't, well, now you do. And we're working on a. I see you. You did come up with a question now. Coming back for that. Now, building off that thought, I'll, I'll finish this thought and then we'll come back to that. Um, we're, work, we're working on a psychology, uh, a psychological and mental health uh, module uh, and its potential role in affecting physical health. So that can also, of course, go vice versa. Your physical health can, of course, infect your mental health. So they are inexorably linked. Microbiome and mental health in the modern environment. And basically talking about how Patho uh, pathophysiology of mental illness combined with new knowledge of host microbiome interactions and psycho uh, neuroimmunology has opened an entirely new field of study that psychobiotics, the modern microbiome, uh, is quite changed compared to our ancestral one due to diet 
antibiotic exposure, and environmental factors. These differences may well impact our brain health, the sheer complexity and scope of how diets, probiotics, prebiotics, and intertwined environmental variables could influence mental health are profound obstacles to an organized and useful study of the microbiome and psychiatric disease. However, the potential for positive anti-inflammatory effects and symptom amelioration with perhaps few side effects makes the goal of clarifying the, uh, the role of the microbiota in mental health a vital one. So this one I actually read the other day and great uh, editorial piece. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, direct research, you know, but it gives you a nice little summary of where we're at with the potential for psychobiotics. I'm going to go, and oh, it's Emily Dean's. Ah, look at that. That makes a lot of sense now. For those who don't know Emily Dean's, <laughs> Psychology Today, she is no, uh, relatively well known in the ancestral health uh, community, evolutionary psychology. So, I'm oh, sorry, evolution, uh, evolution psychiatry with Emily Deans there. So, yeah, she is basically all about. So, she's a psychiatrist who practices basically in using ancestral templates. So, she is a, <laughs> for lack of a better word, a paleo psychiatrist. So, <laughs> and she is the author of Evolutionary Psychiatry. Now, let's see. <laughs> but yeah i saw her talk before all right building off of that going back for a second all right so thoughts on uh silica in drinking water helps with cognitive function any thoughts on that I have briefly come across that. I don't necessarily have a preformed opinion on that that I can just throw out the gate. However, let's take a look real quick. <laughs> let's see what some of the literature says. Oh, come on. There we go. I'll come back for that. All right. Uh, Silica cognitive function. PubMed for it. Ah. Cognitive function. I know that's a relatively popular general idea, but hmm. aluminum and silica in drinking water and the risk of Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline. Interesting. That's a 2010 bad boy. Let's pull that up by PubMed first. <laughs> hmm. Sometimes it works pretty well going directly through. Sometimes it works pretty well going directly through there. But sometimes it works better to actually go through Google, as weird as that is. Potential influence of silica present in drinking water on Alzheimer's disease and associated diseases. Bam. And this is a probably that's like 2007. Ugh. Old one. So that research actually has been around for a while. I just haven't really encountered it too, too much. Uh, maybe protective with respect to a decrease of cognitive function as has been suggested by several epidemiological studies. Okay. Data from our French cohort have demonstrated aluminum in drinking water seems to have a deleterious effect and increase the risk of cognitive impairment when the silica concentrations were low. Moreover, if there was, it has been shown that the performance to a cognitive test were positively correlated to the consumption of silica and that the risk of Alzheimer's disease was reduced in subject, subjects that had higher daily silica intake compared to others. The silica is probably a natural antidote to selenium and could play a role in decreasing the biodisponicity of aluminum, whose neurotoxicity is now clearly established. So, yeah, regarding that in terms of cognitive function, I don't think that silica has a direct beneficial role in terms of benefiting cognitive function. 
What I think is more beneficial is that if you are exposed to aluminum on a sub, somewhat regular basis, that's where things get interesting. So I, it appears that it could have a role in combating aluminum neurotoxicity as opposed to as opposed to actually ah, another one behind a paywall, huh? So let's just see. I'm going to research it and see if they have a PDF. It appears that it would be more so that it's actually going and having a beneficial effect in terms of neutralizing the aluminum. Okay, bam. And boom, stuck behind the paywall. However, I will request a full text from the authors. Let the authors know what you're going to be using their article for by adding it to a project. I will not, in fact, be doing that. <laughs> uh, during chronic ingestion of aluminum on functional characteristics of peritoneal macrophages. So this looks like it is a huh, update on the potential uh, nutritional importance of silicon. Let's see what we got here. Nope, not the one we wanted. Oh. Oh, it's up in the, yeah, that's a good one to use. Or any metal, i.e. vaccines. Yes, that's a great point. So, yeah, that probably will be addressed here. Convincing evidence that silicon is a bioactive beneficial trace mineral continues to accumulate. The evidence has come from human and animal in vitro studies performed by several laboratories and indicate that silicon is a nutritional and supra-nutritional amounts, promotes bone and connective tissue health, may have a modulating effect on the immune or inflammatory response, and has been associated with mental health. A plausible mechanism of action for the beneficial effects of silicon is the binding of hydroxyl groups of polyols, such as it influences the formation and or utilization of glycosylamin. Glycosamine glyc like glycos like glycos amine glyc amino glycans. Fuck. For my for the chemistry terms, sometimes but I haven't seen them before. I can't just like spit them out and roll them off my tongue. Glyce like yeah, I can I can I can break the word down and tell you what we're talking about here. Glyco amino glycans. So we're talking about we're talking about a sugar, a protein, and a sugar being attached there. Trying to pronounce the word glycosaminoglycans. Bam! Got it. <laughs> Mucopolysaccharides and collagen in connective tissue and bone. <sighs> in addition, silicon may affect the absorption, retention, or action of other trace minerals, including uh, such as aluminum, copper, and magnesium, based on findings from animal and human experiments. An intake of silicon of up of near 25 milligrams per day would be a reasonable suggestion for an adequate intake that would assure its nutritional benefits. Increased intakes of silicon through consumption of refined grains, oh, sorry, unrefined grains, certain vegetables and uh, beverages and cereals made from grains should be recognized as a reasonable dietary recommendation. <laughs> that being said, with respect to the vegetables, I'll, I'll agree and say that it probably might not be a terrible idea. Do we have that study? Do we have? We do. Awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see what we got here. Article. Doo -doo. Ah. Reopen that bad boy back up. Get back here, you knucklehead. Ooh, that's a nice fun one here. Silicon stats, beneficial effects, plausible mechanism of actions. Mental health. So high levels of aluminum appeared to have deleterious effect on cognitive function, which we know, when silicon concentration was low. However, when it was high, it had protective effect associated between the high level and impaired cognitive function. So silicon, like we said before, what does appear to be able to uh, does appear to, uh, but it does, it does appear to have a, a beneficial effect on clearing out other heavy metals. So 
Plausible silicon mechanism action. A plausible biochemical mechanism is some of the type of structural or binding rule that affects the formation of the connective tissue when there is strongly bound to significant concentrations. So basically, there's a binding role. It goes and it can go and again, it can bind up. Kind of like before, we were talking about selenium being able to lock up chelate the mercury. It appears that silicon might be able to have a similar effect. Cool. I like it. So it can go and possibly clear out some heavy metals. Awesome. Uh huh. -huh. We have here interrelationship between silicon, aluminum, and elements associated with tissue metabolism and generative process in degenerated human intervertebral disc tissue. So spinal health. Uh, although silicon is considered essential in glycosamine, glycan, and uh, collagen synthesis in connective tissue, it did not show any correlation or similarities with elements reflecting changes associated with degenerative process. So Silicon showed significant correlation with aluminum, similar to those absorbed, uh, observed in other human tissues. So, bioessential silicon shows strong chemical and biological affinity to aluminum, which is toxic and biologically inessential element. The presence of silicon was confirmed in a variety of tissues. However, it has never been examined there, neither in healthy or generated one. So presents for the first time, the content of silicon in degenerated intervertebral disc tissue. Not really pertinent to what we're talking about right now. Basically, though, it's still saying that there is a strong chemical affinity. And this one's a pretty damn new study. This is 2017. So that's cool. Um, yeah, pretty confident that silicon actually, yeah, could be beneficial in dealing with cognitive decline versus aluminum. I like it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So silicon, I'll bet. Specifically looking at heavy medical... Uh, metals silicon heavy metal neurotoxicity so i'll probably put one of these into the into the literature underneath as well one that you can actually review the whole thing exacerbation of methamphetamine neurotoxicity in cold and hot all right, so I will link to, I will link to the other one, the selenium one. I will link to this if you are so inclined as to search out. Or you know what? Let's go back to ResearchGate for a second. Let's see if that one is available. That's where I found it originally, right? Nope, that one is also behind the paywall. Ugh. Let's see. Citations. Who cited it? Overlooked and poorly understood. Hmm. This one is available. Pivotal role in plants. Dietary sources of selenium. Oh, sorry, silicone include red meats, eggs, fish, milk. Uh, Fruits, vegetables, water, tea, nutritional benefits of silicon include reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, atherosclerosis. <laughs> hmm, interesting. So silicon uptake. Going back again. Go back over there. Cool. Yeah. Let's see. Download. Oh, Simon B. Asking me the full text, but the way it's doing that. Hmm. Awesome. This one is a full text one. Let's see if it has reference to aluminum. Aluminum. Yeah. Apparently can't. <laughs> Good. Likewise, low silicon. Cool. Yes, yeah, so this one will be talking about the importance of silicon in human nutrition. And this is a relatively new one. This one is 2015. Uh, I'll take a look at this one more later too. But I will put this in the description so you guys can take a look at that as well. 
we have a better idea what we're looking at here. This is a citing article of what we were looking at before, and it's a newer one. And you have access to the full one. Yay! <laughs> so, strengthening bones, improve immune response, as well as neuronal connective tissue health. Interesting. So, I may have to look into more on adding that to certain things. Dietary sources. Plant-based foods. Dietary sources for humans. We said that before. Let's see. Growing chicks. <laughs> Always a good time to be growing chicks. <laughs> Looks good. All right. Edit. Boom. So we'll add that bad boy to the list of studies that you guys can take a look at. If you are so inclined, if you are a nerd like me, which Murray, I know that you in fact are, and anybody else is on right now. <laughs> Boom. Bam. All right, let's add that to the list. I'm going to add the other one, the uh, selenium one at some point, but for now, what the hell was I going to look at? I was going to look at something. I don't remember anymore. Who the hell knows? Who even knows anymore? I don't know. <laughs> we are at an hour mark right now. So we are pretty deep into the hole. Um, you guys have been asking some really good questions, though. I'm definitely happy about that. What were we looking for? We're not looking at. Nope. Talk about that one. That one's going to go into the box in a second. Uh, kill that. Kill that. What were you talking about? Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. <laughs> oh, man. All right. What the heck? All right. Good. Yes, we'll add Emily Dean's microbiome and health. We also have to add the... Did I add that one already? No, next time. We also have to add the... Silicone, a uh, selenium one for you. Mm -hmm. So down in the description, we have those bad boys. All about the microbiome, all that fun stuff, all the time. <laughs> Where do we have the my, uh, selenium one there already? Oh no, we already have the selenium one there. Way ahead of it. Way, way ahead. I had to add the. I had to add that one. <laughs> sorry, down. Sorry, I'm losing myself here. Adding down in the description box, I was adding different. Um, was going and adding different studies to it, so you can take a look at certain things. Don't mind me, just going crazy here. <laughs> oh boy! All right. So at this point, we are an hour in. We've answered a bunch of different questions. Got some pretty good questions in there. Oh. Silica, that's what I want to do. Kill me, kill me here. Silica, world's healthiest foods, see what they have. So, yeah, I've talked about it before. World's healthiest foods is a decent source to look at first. Um, in terms of quick, dirty, what micronutrient, what are the best source of a micronutrient? Now, it appears they don't, they don't have one for silica. Hmm. Green beans... So let's see what we got. Best sources of silica. And then we can always verify that on the USTA database. Terry's Talk Nutrition. Efficient silica. I don't know. Hmm. Aha. Dietary. Silica intake and absorption. We then estimated the gastrointestinal intake or uptake of silicon from major food sources and studied how the uptake correlated with silicon content of foods. Interesting. Let's see. <laughs> Framingham cohort studies. Interesting. Mean silicon extrusion. Let me just pull up the P 
PDF. I hate looking at those. Could just be me, but I'm just so used to looking at PDFs that for studies that it just works better for me. Uh -huh. I'm just looking for one of the best sources of silicon, damn it. Okay. Corn flakes, wheat biscuits, high brand cereals. <laughs> 10 milligrams of sil uh, silica brown rice pasta. So green beans appear to be a decent source. Iceberg lettuce. Look at that. Interesting. Yellow bananas are at 13. So yellow bananas appear to be a much better source of silicon than, say, and that's a, yeah, 250 uh, grams of bananas. So that's like one banana, I guess. I don't know. Is 13 grams of 100 grams of high brand cereal. Oh, here. It actually tells us what type. Kellogg's All Brand Plus. Yummy. So Kellogg's All Brand Plus has 10.17. That's interesting. This study uses a lot of uh, those there. Uncle Ben's Long Grain Rice is what? Number 8? <laughs> has 2.48. Milligrams. So right now, again, that banana is looking pretty, pretty dominant. And then there's your mineral water. There's your mineral water, Murray. So, so high silicon mineral water. Although it's not what you say. You had mentioned, what was it, Fuji? We have Evian comes in with 3.44. Whereas Volvic, I don't know who Volvic is, but it's another... Mineral wards, a purposefully high silicon one, is 7.23 for half a liter. And a liter is what? 32? Eh, 31, whatever. It's close to a quart. So 16 half. So yeah, so like a six, I like guess a, a bottle of water, of high mineral water, probably gets you closer. It gets you more than everything except for the Kellogg's high, uh, all brand plus. But the banana kicks everybody's butt. So bananas, carrots at 4.58 is not terrible. Uh, Yeah. So going back, you said before, the mineral wars. I know I've heard that before. Never really dove too deep into it. But I'm definitely a fan. Mineral waters, good idea. Uh, we want to thank Janice Mars and... Ning Kuo of Tufts University in Boston for database development and analysis of silicon intake in the Framingham study. I want to know is disclosures. That's what I'm interested in. I ain't got financial disclosures because <laughs> no mention of disclosures, eh? Conflict? Do you use the word conflict? Uh -huh. No. Huh. Well, this one is an older study anyway. Um, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Update on the potential nutrient pour. Yeah, this is this bad boy here. No mention of conflicts, though. Meh. Whatever. I'm not really too worried. I don't think there's that that much going on. They could have just grabbed a damn bottle of a box of Kellogg's. <laughs> Whatever. Not too worried. All right. Well, I'll add that one just for funsies as well in terms of that. Um, mostly because there doesn't appear to be much in the way of newer research. It probably is. I'm just being lazy right at this point. <laughs> Realistically, in terms of the best sources of uh, silicon, we basically touched on everything we were talking about before regarding the water being the best. In the one article, they were really trying to push the unrefined grains. And to be fair, your Kellogg's All Grain Plus, All, all Brand Plus, did appear to be a decent source, but meh, whatever. So this one right here, would be a decent idea. The dietary silicon intake and absorption by Jugdaum Singh. Yeah, say that one. Appears to be a good bet for you on that. But yeah, 
you know what? Unless you have any more questions, I think we're going to call it at this point. We've been on this chat for this live stream for what, an hour and 10 right now, it looks like. Been out here quite a bit. So I think that's about where we're at, uh, hour five. Um, either way, I think we're going to call it. Unless you have any last questions. Otherwise, guys, thank you for popping on. Everybody who joined tonight, if you're watching this on the replay, thank you as well. That's awesome. Love you guys. Um, oh, in case you haven't seen them and you're watching this late, we have here my Ask My K-Man t-shirts, right? All right, all right. You can get yours with the link in the description, but we have it right here. Bam. Probably still can't see it. Bam. They are comfy as all hell, but uh, yeah, I think that's it. Guys, possibly if I can actually go and not get crushed by schoolwork, maybe see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know what to do. Like, subscribe down below. Share with your friends, please. You know the deal. I'll see you tomorrow. Possibly. <laughs> All right, let's kill this.